In this extraordinary place, a new idea was born. On March 1, 1872, President Ulysses S. Grant signed into existence the world's first national park, Yellowstone National Park. The 2.2 million acres of wilderness was set apart as a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. This glorious park contains over one half of the world's hydrothermal features. Indeed, the largest and most varied collection of natural hot water phenomena on Earth. including over 300 geysers. Yellowstone is a caldera. It's um, had several very large eruptions and a caldera is basically where the earth has had gas and magma pressure from underneath stretching the earth's crust. Eventually cracks and fissures form around that bulge and hot ash and lava spew out the sides of the, the volcano and then the top part of it, that stretched earth, collapses in on itself forming a big crater or caldera. And since our last eruption, which was about 640,000 years ago, that we've had subsequent uh, lava flows that have filled it in. So it's really t difficult to tell that there's a huge caldera inside of Yellowstone. Um, but there's some evidence of um, the edges of the caldera, but you can definitely tell that there's a hot, um, active volcano in Yellowstone. I start each presentation that I give throughout this region by saying Yellowstone. Just that word has something sacred to it something sacred in its meaning. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, Yellowstone is in many ways a holy place for those whose temples are the mountains and the wilderness. It's a place unlike any other that I've ever had the opportunity to experience. And I think the, the wildness that exists here in Yellowstone, the dynamic nature of this region from a geological standpoint, an ecological standpoint, um, the watersheds, uh, the rivers, the wildlife, it's just, uh, it's such a unique place and it's a place that um, brings people from all over the world. And you look at the arch and it's a, truly a place of pilgrimage. It's a land that brings people from all over the world uh, to experience uh, something wild, something, something primeval. It's a unique place in the world. The only complete temperate mid-latitude ecosystem left on the planet that's big enough to contain the entire range of large mammals. The large predators, bear, wolves, coyotes, fox, osprey, owls, and eagles, and big enough to contain their prey, elk, deer, 
moose. Bighorn sheep. Pronghorn. And of course, the ancient American bison. Yellowstone country is the American equivalent of the African plains. People travel from all over the globe to visit uh, the Serengeti of Africa. And I think this is the closest thing we have to that in, in North America. And yet when you add the spirit of the geysers, uh, you add the fact that we have over 10,000 thermal features in this region. You add the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone with that 308 foot plunge fall. Uh, I think that's one of the most remarkable landscapes, uh, certainly in the West. Uh, to me, it's the most inspiring landscape we have in the Northern Rockies, to stand at Artist Point, uh, where Thomas Moran stood in 1871 and created his famous watercolors that helped to inspire the establishment of Yellowstone National Park, which has subsequently become so important to people from all over the globe. Um, it, it's a place that's humbling, it's inspiring, it's moving. My favorite thing about Yellowstone is that I'll never know it all. There's always something new to learn, and so it, it uh, it helps me become curious to learn about it. And there's a special magic to Yellowstone that just taking a hike through the park, you can experience. And one of my fondest memories of Yellowstone is hiking with a friend to Artist Paint Pots early in the morning. And we walked through the forest to get to the mud pots. And on our way back, all of a sudden the sun was glistening on all these spider webs in the trees that we had passed earlier in the morning that d we didn't even notice. It was like, just like a magic spell. All those um, things had appeared just um, out of the blue in a short amount of time. So there's always something new to see and to discover and, and, you'll n and we'll never see it all. The Yellowstone ecosystem, Yellowstone country, is more than just one park. It's thousands of acres of national forests. National forests encompassing mountain ranges. And there is the most spectacular mountain park in the country, Grand Teton National Park. A park containing breathtaking mountain peaks, glacial lakes, wetlands, and gravelly moraines. The forces that shape this land, the great thermal features, the jagged mountain peaks, and the forces that created the greater Yellowstone country are the most powerful and violent geological forces on the planet. Volcanoes and glaciers. It all waits for you. Waits for you to experience. It's simply called Yellowstone. There is only one way to fully grasp the vastness and beauty of Yellowstone country. By air. The journey departs from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, the southern gateway to Yellowstone. Immediately below is the Snake River, originating in Yellowstone Park to the north and flowing south the Snake, which eventually joins the Columbia, is over 1,365 miles long, the largest North American river that empties into the Pacific Ocean. You are now over Grand Teton National Park. Between the river and the Teton Mountain Range 
are numerous mountain glacial features, moraines, and kettle lakes. Suddenly, looming almost out of nowhere are the Grand Tetons themselves. Matterhorn peaks, glacial valleys, and stunning ice fields. While Yellowstone's journey to becoming a park was swift and easy, Grand Teton National Park's journey, on the other hand, was long and arduous. In 1897, Congress set aside Teton Forest Reserve. 32 years later, the central peaks seen here were given national park status. However, in order to preserve the views and the territory's complete ecosystem, the post-glacial features to the east of the Tetons also needed to be protected. One of America's great philanthropists, John D. Rockefeller Jr., came to the rescue. He bought over 35,000 acres of farm and ranch land in Wyoming's Jackson Valley, along the Snake River, and donated it to the federal government. Then in 1943, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued a presidential proclamation creating Jackson Hole National Monument. A 221,000 acre Jackson Valley tract of land including Rockefeller's donation. By 1950, the National Monument and the original park were joined into today's spectacular Grand Teton National Park. In the northern reaches of Grand Teton National Park is the breathtaking Jackson Lake. The lake was created during the last ice age when a massive ice field gouged and cut its deep reservoir. It is still fed by runoff from small glaciers in the Teton Mountains. The main source of water, however, is the Snake River. At an elevation of 6,772 feet above sea level, Jackson Lake is one of the largest high-altitude lakes in the U.S. 15 miles long, 7 miles wide, and 400 feet deep. As the plane leaves the Jackson Valley and enters Yellowstone Park, striking changes take place. The land rises dramatically into Yellowstone's youngest lava flow, the 70,000-year-old Pitchstone Plateau. The Pitchstone Plateau is one of nine named plateaus in Yellowstone National Park. These plateaus make up the greater Yellowstone Plateau. Even in the summer, the pitchstone remains covered in snow. 
snows that average over 50 feet per year. Below the snow is a vast area of unwooded lava, resembling, as more than one writer has described it, a moonscape. Contained within the Pitchstone Plateau are two of Yellowstone's treasures, Lewis Lake and Shoshone Lake, the second largest lake in the park, and one that can only be reached by backpacking or canoe. The overall Yellowstone Plateau was created through three volcanic cycles spanning over two million years. Volcanic cycles that produce some of the world's largest and most violent volcanic eruptions. Traveling further north is the 200,000 acre wilderness area known as Yellowstone's Central Plateau. Surrounded by the park's lower loop road system, the Central Plateau wilderness consists of a vast lodgepole pine forest. Yellowstone is covered uh, mostly by a lodgepole pine forest. Lodgepoles are a tree that's very well adapted to growing in areas where the soil might not be as rich as in other areas. So it's a very volcanic, a pretty young volcanic area, and lodgepoles grow very well here. The lodgepole is a, is a tall, thin a pine tree, and if you drive around Yellowstone, you'll see things that look like almost like telephone poles with a Christmas tree on top. Um, those are the lodgepole pine. They cover about 80% of the park. Uh, they're very well also adapted to fire. Uh, some of the pine cones are covered with a waxy resin. So when uh, fire runs through the forest, uh, the wax from that resin protects those pine cones and the heat melts the resin off and the pine cones kind of pop open and scatter their seeds on the newly opened forest floor. Uh, because the canopy has been burnt uh, by fire, um, there's sunlight, water, and nutrients can reach the forest floor, and they, those lodgepole pines um, grow best where they get a lot of sunlight. In Yellowstone, there are vast areas where fire has raced through the lodgepole pine forest, and the grand scale of the fires can be seen from the air. The central plateau, while devoid of high peaks, abounds in meadows, wildlife, thermal features, and rivers. Yellowstone um, has some great uh, rivers that offer people great uh, chances to view wildlife and, and to uh, fish and that sort of thing. Uh, we have uh, the Yellowstone River that starts actually outside the park and flows into the Yellowstone Lake and then flows out of Yellowstone Lake, flows in a north, north fashion. Gibbon, Madison, and Firehole meet at uh, Madison Junction, and they, they flow out of the park. And those are also spectacular places for wild, watching wildlife and, and fishing. And um, So we do have a number of rivers. They flow based on where they are on the Continental Divide. The Continental Divide is kind of like the crest of the continent. And as the um, water uh, hits either side of that continental divide, it determines which path those rivers take. And so the ones that flow or flow on the west side of the continental divide will eventually flow into the Pacific Ocean. The ones on the east side of the continental divide will eventually uh, flow into the Mississippi and down to the Gulf of Mexico. Here is a map of the greater Yellowstone area. The continental divide runs through it like this. Here is the famous Lower Loop Road. And here is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. A canyon that is a primary geologic feature of the park. It is roughly 20 miles long and contains a place where the Yellowstone River drops a distance greater than Niagara Falls. Almost 400 feet. However, 
The reason the park was set aside in the first place lies in its magnificent thermal features, its geysers and hot springs. From the air, the hot springs appear as shimmering blue pools of water, surrounded by light-colored barren landscapes. These are called thermal basins. What's exclusive to Yellowstone is its concentration of over 300 geysers, thermal areas where superheated water periodically erupts into the air. The most famous is, of course, Old Faithful, a spectacular geyser that erupts like clockwork. Every 65 minutes, if an eruption lasts less than 2.5 minutes, or 91 minutes if the eruption lasts more than 2.5 minutes. It's very unusual for geysers to be predictable. The fact that we can predict about five or six different geysers in Yellowstone is quite, quite unusual. Uh, Old Faithful has been very reliable and very predictable over the history of the park. Uh, it's how it got its name, is because it was very faithful and erupted pretty regularly. Um, over the years, a lot of observers of Old Faithful have been um, timing it and, and recording the times of eruptions and noticing uh, very uh, distinct patterns, and that's how we predict Old Faithful. Um, plumbing systems for a geyser have chambers that have to fill up between eruptions, so after an eruption those chambers have been emptied and there's a certain amount of time that they have to fill up again. The uh, Old Faithful has kind of a regular set pattern. The longer the eruption, the more water that uh, uh, erupts out of it and the more water that has to fill in. So we time Old Faithful with basically a stopwatch. Um, and the longer the eruption, the longer the interval to the next one. The highlight of any aerial trip is a thermal feature that can only be fully appreciated from the air. A thermal feature known as the Grand Prismatic. The Grand Prismatic is the largest hot spring in the United States. The deep blue spring extends over an area approximately 250 by 300 feet and is 160 feet deep. The spring discharges an estimated 560 gallons of 160 degree water per minute into the surrounding landscape. Surely, this is one of the most unearthly beautiful sights on the planet. It is a sight worth savoring and remembering for a lifetime. The Grand Prismatic is just one of the countless thermal features that are derived from Yellowstone Country's matchless geology. The geology of Yellowstone Country begins with the rising up of the Rocky Mountains about 55 to 80 million years ago. The Rockies are a spectacular mountain system that stretches from Canada to central New Mexico. The Rockies were once massive and tall, nearly four miles above sea level. Today, while still splendid, erosion has reduced them to nearly half their former glory. However, one range, the Grand Teton Range, recaptures a bit of that ancient stature. Without any foothills, 
the Grand Teton Range seems to spring up directly out of the earth. Its cathedral group of peaks energizes and delights the eye. Each perspective, each season, each passing hour brings a new sense of awe. Rising up only 10 million years ago, the range is the youngest in the Rockies. However, it was the ice ages over the last 1.8 million years that carved the Tetons into their rugged pose. A pose accented by its present day mountain glaciers. The requirement for a mountain glacier, or for any glacier for that matter, is that uh, the snow that has fallen the previous winter doesn't melt the following summer. And so we have to have a continual buildup of the ice. And clearly, the place where the, where the snow has the best chance of remaining uh, through the annual cycle, through the next summer, is at the highest altitudes where the temperatures are the coldest. So when snow falls in the mountains over the wintertime, uh, obviously it's above the snow line and um, it's going to be at the highest elevations. When the snow accumulates and doesn't melt the following summer, then we start to build up uh, the mountain glaciers. Glaciers uh, at all times are going to be flowing. The ice deforms plastically or ductily and the, the ice is always flowing and it's, and it's drawn downhill by gravity and, uh, and so if we're, if we're constructing glaciers at the highest peaks of the mountains, gravity is drawing that ice downward and as that ice moves downward it starts to erode the rock over which it's been uh, laid down. As the rock begins to erode, there's preferential areas that the glaciers are going to flow, just like there are preferential river valleys that rivers will flow. And so when we look at the highest mountain peaks, um, the glaciers will, will start to sculpt certain sides of the mountains. And they generally do this on a more or less triangular fashion so that there's faceted slopes or faceted uh, scalloped slopes on uh, on Three or, three or more sides of the mountain. It's those faceted areas or scalloped areas that are called cirques and, they, and uh, the cirques are separate from one another by a knife point edge generally that's called an arete. So it goes cirque, cirque, and in between is the arete. Those cirques uh, are really the birthplace of the glacier and that's and when you're uh, in, the, in the high mountain areas, that's where the accumulation of snow is going to continually feed the glaciers as they tend to move down, uh, down the valley and continually carve out those cirques. There is perhaps no better place in the continental United States to view cirques and the pyramid-shaped peaks called glacial horns than in the Grand Teton Range. Oddly, the Rockies disappear as one enters Yellowstone National Park. The reason is a bizarre geological feature known as a hot spot. American soil is home to three hot spots. One rests below Flagstaff, Arizona, and has been quiescent for thousands of years. The second created the Hawaiian Islands and is actively spewing lava on the largest of the islands, the Big Island of Hawaii. The third now sits below Yellowstone National Park. What is a hot spot? A hot spot is uh, a plume of molten magma from deep within the mantle, uh, which is uh, sort of like a, a candle uh, that's flickering beneath the Earth's crust. And it stays stationary, and the crust itself is, is moving over top of that feature. 
And from time to time over the last 20 million years, uh, there have been these enormous eruptions that have occurred as a result of the, that, that mantle plume. The most recent of those events is beneath Yellowstone National Park. It happened only 600,000 years ago. The effects of what is now called the Yellowstone Hotspot have been moving in a southwesterly direction at a rate of about one inch per year. Starting near the Oregon-Idaho border, it has produced a dramatic trail of volcanic effects. wiping out everything in its path. 15 to 20 massive eruptions have left behind a series of immense craters that dot the landscape from its origin through Idaho Snake River Basin and on into Yellowstone National Park. A hotspot is clearly one of the most powerful forces in nature. powerful enough to swallow up a vast stretch of the Rocky Mountains. There were a lot of uh, mountains when Yellowstone, um, before there was the caldera eruptions, there were chains of, of mountains that ran through the whole park. And as the caldera, uh, after the caldera exploded and collapsed in on itself, it basically swallowed up part of those mountain systems. And as the lava filled in, it, it built up a high plateau. So you'll see uh, different mountain ranges radiating out of Yellowstone, but the middle part is uh, without mountains uh, and has a built up plateau from those lava eruptions. Lava that could erupt again at any time. Here on the map, is the edge of the caldera, the edge of the Yellowstone volcano. Multiple fault lines across the region make it earthquake prone. Yellowstone is very geologically active, not just with volcanic activity, but there's a lot of ground movement here. We get many earthquakes, about 1,000 to 3,000 earthquake tremors per year. Um, and most of those cannot be felt but it's the heat produced by the hotspot that is today generating Yellowstone's thousands of thermal features. When people come to Yellowstone, they see a great variety of hot springs and geysers. Uh, Yellowstone's home to more than 10,000 hydrothermal features. Hydrothermal means uh, water and heat together. And so we have hot springs, geysers, mud pots, and fumaroles. A fumarole is a hot steam vent. A hot spring is a hot pool of water, and um, geysers are where the hot spring erupts out of the ground, shooting water at various heights. Um, as you drive around Yellowstone, you see a great variety of those. Uh, the difference uh, between the hot springs and the geysers is that a hot spring is uh, relatively calm. It might be bubbling a little bit from the heat or gas bubbles. And a geyser um, has a different kind of plumbing system. It, it has a constriction underground that uh, acts as kind of a stopper to, as the pressure builds up underneath it. And, the, um, and as the little bit of pressure is released, the water and gas erupts out in an eruption. Uh, so the basic difference is a plumbing system between the two, um, although some hot springs are not hot enough to erupt as a geyser. There are a dozen or so thermal basins that are readily accessible to the Yellowstone visitor. Yellowstone National Park has over half of the world's geysers, and most of them are located in the upper geyser basin. This remarkable one square mile area contains at least 150 of these hydrothermal wonders, making it the most densely concentrated geyser region in the world. Three major geysers, Grand, Castle, and Old Faithful are located here 
Each day, during the high season, thousands of visitors walk from the parking lot to the circular boardwalk to experience an old fateful eruption for themselves. Their anticipation is palpable, as there are many false starts. Old Faithful's rather predictable, which is unusual. Possibly its plumbing system is segregated from other active features. A lot of the underground plumbing, the cracks and fissures that uh, plumb individual geysers are connected to each other. So if you have one um, that, is at, that has no regular pattern, it can affect the pattern of the other. And perhaps Old Faithful's plumbing system is segregated from other um, active features and that makes it uh, very regular. Located about a mile north of the Old Faithful area is Black Sand Basin. Some of the most colorful hydrothermal features in the park abound here. Originally, it was called the Emerald Group because of the amazing jewel-like hot springs on display here. But its name changed when tourists began calling it Black Sand Basin because of the small fragments of obsidian sand that covers portions of the basin. A beautifully placed network of boardwalks takes the visitors up close and personal with its plethora of hot springs and geysers. Emerald Pool is the most colorful and famous of Black Sand Basin's features. The clear water reflects the blues, but absorbs the other hues of the color spectrum. And the combination produces its deep emerald green color. The stunning outer ring is a fringe of yellow and orange. Here it's much lower temperature, 154.6 degrees Fahrenheit has allowed yellow bacteria and algae to grow on the lining of the pool. Opalescent Pool is a cooler thermal pool. Early in its history, Opalescent was a boiling spring, surrounded by smaller springs. However, by the early 1950s, it was nearly a dry pool then Spouter Geyser began erupting, and its runoff brought Opalescent Pool back to life. Constantly bubbling, Cliff Geyser is named for its cliff-like wall of geyserite formed around the crater, and for its location on the edge of Iron Spring Creek. This geyser, like most geysers in the park, is irregular in its eruptions. Interestingly, when the geyser is active, there are usually one or two eruptions a day. But there are also periods of dormancy lasting weeks and even years. There are a couple of aptly named little geyser pools that constantly bubble and spew to the delight of visitors. The river running through this area is Iron Spring Creek. It is as colorful as the hot springs. Indeed, like so many of the thermal areas, the hot waters eventually end up in one of the rivers or creeks creating glorious mystical experiences. North of Black Sand Basin is Midway Geyser Basin, the basin that contains the Grand Prismatic Pool. English short story writer Rudyard Kipling, who visited Yellowstone in 1889, immortalized this basin by referring to it as Hell's Half Acre. Even today, it is still remembered by that name. Despite its small size, 
Midway possesses two of the largest hot springs in the world. Grand Prismatic Spring, nearly 370 feet in diameter, sits upon a large mound surrounded by small step-like terraces. The hot springs, when you come to Yellowstone, you'll notice that they're very colorful looking. You'll often see a blue, beautiful hot spring, and around the edges, you'll start to get these variety of colors. Um, for example, Grand Prismatic is, is one of the biggest hot springs. Uh, it has a big, beautiful blue pool and near the very edge is a light yellow. And as the water flows away and cools, you'll start to get some pale oranges, then the darker oranges, browns and greens. Those are little microhabitats um, for uh, microorganisms. So organisms that you wouldn't even be able to see with the naked eye um, you can see because there's so many of them inhabiting the different temperatures of water um, that are flowing out of the hot springs. Um, some of these microorganisms are able to withstand very hot temperatures. Uh, that pale yellow around the edge of, of Grand Prismatic Springs is probably in the, about 165 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And those organisms often that inhabit the hottest waters are often a pale yellow and feed on sulfur. Um, so if you drive around Yellowstone and you smell that rotten egg smell, it's, it's sulfur coming out of the hot springs and, and geysers. Um, it doesn't seem very appetizing to us, but to those microorganisms, it's food. As the water cools, you start to get some of the photosynthetic um, organisms, so the cyanobacterias. Those uh, organisms are able to capture energy from the sun, much like plants do, and to create their own food. And um, in turn, uh, those microorganisms become part of a little miniature ecosystem. Um, the, the photosynthetic bacteria might be grazed upon by ephydrid flies. They're small little black flies you'd see maybe walking around the surface of the cooler parts of the water. Um, sometimes you'll even see the pinkish color egg mounds that are left behind by the ephydrid flies right inside the hot spring waters. Uh, so they're grazing on the cyanobacteria, kind of like elk graze on grass. And there's predators that um, wander in and out of those hot spring areas, like uh, spiders will crawl across the water looking for the ephydrid flies, and, uh, and a, a killdeer bird might go along and peck off, uh, pick off the ephydrid flies and the spider. Greeting the visitors arriving from Cody to the east is Black Dragon's Cauldron. This roiling cauldron is a relatively new feature. Exploding from its subterranean lair in 1948, the area is eerily intriguing. Nearby is the famous Dragon's Mouth Spring. The rhythmic belching of steam and the flashing tongue of water give the Dragon's Mouth Spring its name. At the top of the Laurel Loop Road is one of the most beautiful thermal basins in the park. Because of the long hike, Many visitors often bypass the magnificent artist paint pots. Nowhere is there such a rich conflagration of color. My other favorite is the artist paint pots. It has gooey, the gooey blurpy mud pots, and then it also has the beautiful blue pools. Mud pots form when hot water is limited and hydrogen sulfide gas is present. It's the gas that emits the rotten egg smell common to thermal areas. As a result of these conditions, sulfuric acid is generated, dissolving the surrounding rock into fine particles of silica and clay. They mix with what little water is there to form the seething and bubbling mud pots seen here. 
but it is from the high point of the trail that one can see the swirling colors of an artist's paint pot. Near the north entrance to the park and outside of the Yellowstone caldera is a remarkable thermal area. A thermal area not set in the volcanic rhyolite, but in sedimentary limestone. President of Yellowstone Country Guardians and former park ranger Mike Leach leads tours of this famous thermal feature. Welcome to the Mammoth Hot Springs here in Yellowstone National Park. This is a very historic region. The first hotel in Yellowstone National Park was actually built at the foot of the hot springs here and it's also home to historic Fort Yellowstone. The U.S. Cavalry came to Yellowstone in August of 1886 when 50 members of Company M marched down from Fort Custer, Montana Territory with Captain Moses Harris after being asked by the Department of the Interior to come and help facilitate the protection of Yellowstone National Park. It was features like mammoth that were actually um, being degraded by many entrepreneurs and, and visitors who were curious about the wonders of this region. While many people think of wildlife when they have images of Yellowstone today, grizzly bears, wolves, bison, um, it's important to remember that the boundaries were drawn up in 1872 around Yellowstone National Park as the world's first national park in hopes of keeping all the geothermal features and scenic wonders intact. Uh, it really wasn't the purpose of Yellowstone's establishment to protect the wildlife as much as it was to protect these scenic wonders and incredible thermal features. And while certainly those down in the Norris area uh, can, can argue why that is such a dynamic and extreme environment, um, as someone who had the opportunity to work as a ranger naturalist here in Mammoth for seven years, I will always argue that this is one of the most dynamic geological uh, regions on our planet. I, I always like to say that Yellowstone is not a place but a process, and I don't think any one thermal basin really represents that and demonstrates that more than the Mammoth Hot Springs. So here we are in the vicinity of Pallet Spring. This is certainly one of the most dynamic we have in the region. It's constantly changing. Um, you can look up here and see some of these really unique features. We have four different types of thermal features in Yellowstone National Park. We have hot springs, geysers, fumaroles, and mud pots. All you're going to see here at Mammoth are the hot springs, but they're some of the most spectacular hot springs that this world has to offer. While there's over 10,000 thermal features in Yellowstone National Park, uh, Mammoth, and in particular Pallet, is certainly one of the more well-known. So if you look up top, you'll see where the water comes out of the vent. And as that flows over, you get a feature that we like to, to call a pulpit. And then hanging, hanging off of that pulpit, you'll see stalactites or fluted columns, uh, much like you'd see in a cave. And many people like to describe this as an inside-out cave that changes very rapidly. And then you'll get those unique cascading features. And when there's um, something trying to displace the flow of the water, like one of these trees, often you'll start to get the buildup of a terrace formation, those stair-step like wedding cake style formations that makes this area so unique. And then you'll get down into here and you'll get some of these really interesting uh, mini terraces or scalloping effects. But let's talk a little bit about how this forms and, and really why this area is so dynamic. If you were to look up here at Mount Everts, uh, Mount Everts was once underwater approximately 60 to 120 million years ago. Um, that, this region uh, was largely sculpted by uh, the Absorca volcanic period that was about 50 million years ago. But roughly 60 to 120 million years ago there was an inland ocean here in this region. And when that ocean receded it left fossils, shells, and crustaceans that formed a layer of limestone over a thousand feet thick. Uh, we're sitting on a hot spot here in Yellowstone. And the definition of a hot spot is a plume of magma very close to the Earth's surface. 
where, where most people throughout North America live, that magma will be 21 to 50 miles beneath the Earth's surface. Here it's three to seven miles uh, beneath the Earth's surface, beneath the crust. And so that's what creates all this dynamic thermal activity here. We have a lot of snow. You can see anytime you visit Yellowstone, it's smart to bring an umbrella and some uh, rain gear and certainly some warm clothes because we're at over 6,500 feet in elevation right now and much of the Yellowstone Plateau is at over 7,000 feet in elevation and so the weather can change drastically. But we have a lot of snowfall. In fact, we're sitting at about 226 percent of our annual snowfall in the upper Yellowstone River drainage. And while most of that snow will work its way into the river systems, and we'll get spring runoff and we'll have this scouring effect of this region's most powerful uh, erosive process, which is the water, the rivers coursing throughout this region. Um, some of that will work its way to the groundwater. So in this region, where you have the several most likely streams and channels working their way through the limestone, that water is heated up by the magma. And when that magma heat, heats the water, the water wants to rise. But not only does the magma send up heat, but it also sends up gases. And the most important of the gases in the Mammoth region is carbon dioxide. Because when the carbon dioxide mixes with the water, it forms a weak acidic solution, a carbonic acid. So now as the water is rising through the cracks and fissures in the limestone, it's eating away at that limestone and carrying it in solution form until it reaches the Earth's surface. If you were to walk up to the, the vent here at any of these springs like Hyman or Pallet Spring, you would see what looks like boiling water. The boiling temperature at this elevation is approximately 199 degrees. The higher an elevation, the, the, the lower the temperature in terms of uh, your, your boiling point. So what you're seeing up there is actually gases being released. You'll smell a little of that hydrogen sulfide. We certainly don't have uh, the concentration of hydrogen sulfide you'd see throughout some of the other uh, thermal areas, the geyser basins where they have a compact center uh, where rhyolite is the bedrock. Uh, thus a presence of sulfur and hydrogen sulfide, but the carbon dioxide is released. Once the carbon dioxide is released, the bond is broken and the water can no longer hold the limestone in solution form and thus it precipitates out. So wherever you see water flowing here, it's actively precipitating limestone. We used to say that we could see a growth of about 8 to 12 inches in a one year time period, but in my last year rangering here in 2007, we documented a growth at Pallet Spring of over a meter. And so that's one of the things that makes this region so dynamic. As this continues to grow, it can either cap itself off or plug its own plumbing system. And since this water is all coming from one source and looking for the path of least resistance, if it can't come out at a spring where it's come out in some cases for decades, it'll come out somewhere else. So we're, all, we're always asked here at the Mammoth Hot Springs, why are the springs drying up? Because people remember springs like Minerva Terrace and when it was in its heyday it looked like this whole hill was active but we believe the water level stays relatively constant in this region it's just always changing. So when you visit the Mammoth Hot Springs take some pictures of some of these springs that are very dynamic and active now because when you come back 20-25 years from now when you come back three months from now uh, it could be dry. A dry area could be active. This was an area that was never active during my time from 2002 to 2007 working as a ranger up here and so it just speaks to the dynamic nature of, of the Mammoth Hot Springs. The colors here are quite unique. When you travel around Yellowstone National Park and you visit the thermal areas, um, most of the colors you're going to see is similar to what you see here at Mammoth, but you'll also see a lot of iron oxides and minerals. The mineral here is calcium carbonate or travertine, it's deposited limestone. That's the white and, and gray stuff. The gray stuff is the weathered limestone. But all the colors you're seeing here, the, the yellows, the oranges, uh, the greens, they're what we call thermophiles. They're thermophilic, meaning heat-loving microorganisms, primarily bacteria and algae, that need the heat and need the water to survive. And so you can ta see a lot about the dynamic nature of this region by looking at the colors, because typically the hotter the water, the lighter the colors. You can see the main runoff channels there are white. There's most likely organisms living in that water, but they're so microscopic we're not seeing their pigments. And then the further you get from that, you'll start to get into some of these darker colors, uh, the algaes, the browns, the greens. Um, another thing that's really dynamic about this mammoth area is you can look at an area like you see right up here to the left where there's no water flowing, but there's color. 
Uh, if there's stark white rock with no water flowing, that typically tells you that there's been water flowing sometime in the last year to year and a half, because after about a year and a half, the rock will, will begin to weather and turn gray. But if you see colors, what you're looking at there essentially are dead or dying uh, thermophiles, because they need the heat, they need the water, the water's not flowing there, and so you're looking at their pigment. And, and if you see that, that pigment and it's bright, that can tell you that there's been water flowing sometime, most likely in the last two weeks. And so, you know, even as an amateur naturalist, you can come here to Yellowstone, visit the Mammoth Hot Springs, and certainly uh, begin to experience the wonders of this uh, incredibly dynamic area. And it really speaks to the uh, enigmatic and mysterious uh, heart of this wild landscape. With a thermal history similar to Mammoth Hot Springs, yet not a thermal area, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone would qualify as a national park in itself. In the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, that water that uh, the Yellowstone River is flowing through rhyolite that has been decayed by thermal activity underneath. So steam and heat are um, percolating through that rhyolite. It's kind of a, a softening the rock. And as the river flows through it, it, through it, it is more easily cut and uh, quickly erodes into the steep walled canyons. I certainly would not make a visit to Yellowstone National Park or the Yellowstone ecosystem without stopping at Artist Point. Uh, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, I firmly believe, is one of the most inspiring and remarkable landscapes we have in the Northern Rockies. To see that canyon that has been created over the course of the last 480,000 years uh, with all the vibrant colors, you're essentially looking at a, at a canyon, a landscape that is rusted. You're seeing the oxidation of, of the iron, and the, the colors are brilliant, the sulfur. Um, that canyon has been hydrothermally altered, um, and thus allowed that most powerful and erosive force we have in this ecosystem, water. And, and there's no more powerful source of water than the Yellowstone River, the longest free-flowing river in the lower 48, to just create that um, incredible canyon with the 308-foot plunge fall. Traveling throughout Yellowstone country, at any moment one can have a personal and unique animal experience. Spot a bushy marmot scurrying across the hillside. Hear the call of the sandhill crane. Encounter a black bear. or come across migratory pronghorns in the lush Lamar Valley. That is the promise of wild Yellowstone. The promise of the Yellowstone experience. Yellowstone National Park is the heartbeat of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But Yellowstone National Park itself, as large as it is, at roughly 2.2 million acres in size, it's approximately 3,000 472 square miles, larger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware combined, um, is not an intact ecosystem in and of itself. The greater Yellowstone ecosystem, or the greater Yellowstone area, what we love to call Yellowstone country, which includes countless communities, six national forests, portions of three states, two national parks, uh, adds up to over 18 million acres. And that's what really makes this region so unique. Yellowstone National Park in and of itself is, um, means very little without the land surrounding Yellowstone. It, it certainly is the lifeblood of the region, but with grizzly bears, bison, wolves, with everything that makes this place um, so unique, Yellowstone National Park can't support a viable population of those animals. So, um, for instance, with the grizzly bear, uh, an adult male grizzly bear could have an average home range of between 800 and 2,000 square miles. The highlight of each spring in Yellowstone country is to see a mother grizzly emerge from her winter's den with her playful cub in tow. The grizzly bear, which I think really speaks to the wild heart 
of Yellowstone. Uh, I personally, as a former bear education ranger in Yellowstone, don't believe there's a more authentic representation of wildness in the lower 48 than the grizzly. And they've been reduced to less than 2% of their historic range in the lower 48, where there was once upwards of 50,000 grizzly bears in the 1800s, there's approximately 14 to 1,500 left in the lower 48, and they uh, reside, for the most part, in two distinct populations, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem up outside of Glacier National Park and the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So um, this place is truly remarkable. It's home to one of the last uh, genetically pure, uh, continually free-ranging wild bison population. Um, the, you know, the story of the bison here is, is uh, one that is treasured by people from all throughout the West and all over the globe. To go out there and see on a day like today in June with you have all the succulents and fecundity returning to the ecosystem and to see a burnt orange bison calf out there spastically frolicking among the grasses is just, uh, it's unique to Yellowstone. And, uh, the return of the wolf in 1995 speaks to the wild heart of this region. And so um, it really is a place like no other when it comes to the lower 48 states because it is so intact ecologically and biologically. It is also home to North America's largest members of the deer family, elk, and moose. Behind only the bison, the moose is the second largest land animal in North America. This majestic, if somewhat ungangly, appearing 1,500 pound giant is the icon of Grand Teton National Park. And one of the main reasons tourists flock to the park each year. Nowhere else is there a better chance of seeing one of these magnificent solitary creatures. Moose favor damp areas of brushy vegetation, such as that along the Snake River habitat. There is not a more surprising sight than the bull moose with a full rack of antlers. No more surprising sight, unless it's a newborn elk calf lying under an SUV in one of Yellowstone's campgrounds. Elk are the second largest antlered animals in the world. Only moose are larger. Bull elk are four and a half to five feet tall at the shoulder and weigh between 550 and 800 pounds. Cow elk weigh from 450 to 600 pounds. While most members of the deer family are primarily browsers feeding on twigs and leaves of shrubs and trees, elk are both browsers and grazers, feeding extensively on grasses and forbs as well as shrubs. An astonishing 30,000 elk from seven to eight different herds summer in Yellowstone. And approximately 15,000 to 22,000 winter in the park. While another 7,500 elk winter around Grand Teton National Park. Winter is the longest and most difficult time for many of Yellowstone Country's elk and many of its non-migratory animals. Indeed, winter lasts more than half the year. It isn't until sometime in late May that early wildflowers herald the arrival of spring in Yellowstone. It is also the time of calving in the park.
Yellowstone Lake's winter ice finally breaks up. Rushing streams and rivers carry the snowmelt out of the park on its long journey to the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Then comes the high season for tourism. Then summer comes to Yellowstone, uh, things start to get a little drier, a little warmer. Uh, the animals uh, change where they, they graze as the lower elevations uh, dry up, the grasses brown up. And so at the higher elevations where it hasn't uh, gotten as warm or hot, the grasses uh, might be a little more lush and green. And so the animals will move up in elevation where it's a little cooler, the grasses are a little greener. Um, and that's often uh, when some of the mating seasons start to kick in as the summer progresses. So in August, the bison will start their rut. Um, they'll, you'll see big bull bison charging at each other um, and doing battle. They'll be rolling in the dirt and kicking up dust and um, competing for the females. The arrival of fall brings cool, crisp days. The park's deciduous trees turn their vivid fall colors. And the mist from the hundreds of hot springs becomes more robust. By November, winter returns. Whatever the season, there is no place like Yellowstone country. And I think um, when, when the people come to Yellowstone, they come here to get unplugged. They come here to experience something that their grandparents experienced, uh, to, to experience something that I think is in our blood, that's something important for us um, on, a, on a spiritual level. I think that places like Yellowstone help to provide some level of uh, spiritual sustenance. Uh, I think it, it, there's tangibles here, and then there's the intangibles. And the intangibles, I think, uh, are one of the things that makes Yellowstone such a remarkable landscape. This is a place that deeply inspires people. Uh, it's, it's a place that people love, a place that people are moved by. And I think when people visit this region and when they come to the Yellowstone ecosystem as a whole, but certainly to Yellowstone National Park, uh, in many ways they're not only, they're not really just getting unplugged, they're plugging in to uh, something, I think, deeply important to all of us who have the opportunity to visit these wild western landscapes and Yellowstone certainly I believe is in a class all of its own. <laughs>